Indeed, the word replenish, meaning many, many things. To make complete again, to be full of something. Not full of the something we usually figure each other full of, but full of the something of God. The something different, the the grace, the passion, the love. Even so wild as to think we could be full of peace. What a novel thought in a very unpeaceable world. But that's what the psalmist was writing about in Psalm 126. The psalmist was writing about a people of exile who are rejoicing. This is a psalm of joy. We've seen psalms of lament and psalms of gratitude and psalms of forgiveness. But this one, this one is a psalm of joy. And how weird is that, that we're talking about joy in the midst of Lent? You know, next Sunday is Palm Sunday. And then the Sunday after that is the Super Bowl. (laughs) Just my career? Okay, just checking. You have these big Sundays coming up, and in between them is Holy Week, and sometimes we as Christians get in such a rush to get to Easter that we don't sit and savor Lent. We don't go through the process of Lent really understanding what it means to go deeper in our faith and to be a little repentant and how can I do better and to grow in Christ and listen more to the Word of God. We just want to get to Easter because, man, Easter feels good. Easter's joyous. The pews are packed. Everybody's here. Grandma's cooking. Life is great. We want Easter. We don't want Holy Week. Holy Week is hard. It wasn't until I was much later in life that I went to my first Holy Week service, and it was Monday, Thursday, and I thought that was as confusing as you could get. Is it Monday or is it Thursday? Showed up to the church actually on Monday. Um, Yeah, we'll leave that to me. But I came and there was a foot washing. And foot washing kind of makes us a little uncomfortable at times. If I asked you to take your shoes and socks off now and come forward and let me wash your feet, how many of you would run for the doors? Yeah, yeah, okay, I know. You're like, that is not happening. (laughs) You got to give me a heads up and I got to get a pedicure first, right? Jesus took feet that were dirty and unpedicured. They weren't pretty. They were ward, they were worn down from the road. They were rough. They were gnarly. I mean, you think about the gnarliest feet you can think about. And that, that, my friends, was the feet that he would put in his lap and he would wash. He would wash and make clean and make new. How beautiful of a symbol for us during Holy Week. But we miss it because we don't want to take our shoes off. So now we've made it possible for us to wash hands or to be able to just take a rag over a person's shoe and symbolize the nature. But there's a point in what Jesus was saying. Be so vulnerable with me that you will give me, arguably, one of the nastiest parts of your body. Will you trust me to make even that presentable? To make even that beautiful? Will you trust me, your Lord and Savior, to wash your feet? Will you have hope in me? And then you have Good Friday and hard for some of us to argue and understand why in the world we call that good. So we want to skip over that part. We love Palm Sunday because we're having a parade and there's palm branches and the kids are cute and we're singing upbeat songs and woohoo! We don't want that icky stuff in the middle. And then we're going to show up to Easter, woohoo! And the problem is, is if you go from one woohoo to the second woohoo and you preach this, it sounds like you're woohoo. But if you go from one to the second, with nothing in between, you don't have the context. And that is what we miss so much as Christians. We, we go from one song to the next song without getting into the word or getting into the meat or even looking, opening the hymnal and, and looking at the depth of the theology and the words that are written for us. To think these words could be written by someone so many years ago and still be so applicable to us today. God is still God, 
and is still awesome no matter what stage of history we're going to be a part of. And for the people of Psalm 126, that was it. They were a people in exile. They'd lost their homeland. Much had been taken from them. They were in exile, kicked out, moved, kept out. And here, here they are rejoicing because they get to have new life. They get replenished by hope. This dream that they had. The psalmist talks about it as a dream. He says, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, everything that was taken by empire and power and injustice, God restored it. We were like those who dream. Do you remember what it's like to dream? I invite you to go to the second floor. There's some dreaming going on. Once upon a time, there was a congregation that felt like it was a bit in exile. There was a people who felt a bit like the Lord maybe had walked away for a time. And what's next? Now what? And then there was a dream. A dream that in the hope of Jesus Christ, there could be a new day and there could be a new phase. And there could be new life. And we see that being fueled. Replenishment is being filled by something, refueled by something more powerful. There was a people back in the 1950s who called this place home. Some of you may remember. And you were dreamers who looked upon some empty land to the side of this building and said, what could be done? God is calling us to do something new. And back then, the thing to do was exactly what the saints of this church did. It was to build an educational facility. Churches were growing. We weren't in a post-Christian culture anymore. You know, then, we weren't in it yet. And so churches were growing and people were coming. You didn't have to really invite people to church. They just showed up. It was the thing to do. Now we really, really, really have to work at whether or not we want to come and how we invite even to the point that I'm handing you peeps and saying, please bribe people with candy to come and hear the good news of Jesus Christ. If that's what it takes for me to be able to tell someone God loves them, then I will give them all of the candy they want. They can certainly have all of my peeps. (laughs) So we built this three-story structure And it was filled with dreams and people and mission and discipleship. It was built with good bones. But we've come to a time where the world around us changed a bit. The community of Shawnee changed a bit. And it started to look different. And we started to wonder where do we fit in this changing world? Do we still have it in us to dream big dreams? Well, then we started to be a little courageous. Well, what if, what if we could fix a kitchen? What if we could put in showers so our community could shower? What what if we took a building that we could no longer use and had a different vision? What if we could renew it, replenish it? Well, what what an out-of-the-box thought because we don't want to put finances and resources and buildings anymore. We want to put it out in the community, and yet this is exactly what it is, turning what was an education facility into a mission center to serve so many people of our community. Because mission was the dream that turned this church around. Mission was the dream that took a people from exile to joy to replenishment. Mission was the dream that has fed hundreds and thousands of people. It is the dream that tells the victim of physical and sexual violence, you are not alone, we will provide for you. It is the dream that says, we understand that life is hard. We will take you, the homeless family, 
the economically and impoverished and struggling, and we will wrap you in our arms and tell you that you matter, and we will share the love of God with you, and we're going to do that by sharing everything we have with you. We're going to be extravagantly giving to our community because we want to transform it. But it's more so believing in the dream of Jesus. That those who were hungry, the widow and the imprisoned and the children, the poor, the outcast, would be seen and known and named and loved. Lives would be changed because the truth of Scripture, the good news of the gospel would be shared that Jesus Christ came to be with us, to live for us, to die for us. And the best part is not even that he took with those feet of his and carried the weight of our sins all the way up to the mount. It's that he dared to be replenished on the third day. We are a people that believes in resurrection. And so we look at this psalm and then we look at Paul and Paul telling us, look, these are the ways that I've turned my life around. This, this is, and, and he starts off by saying, look, I have all these things. You know, I, I, had, I was a Pharisee and I had education and I had power and I had might and, um, you know, I could manipulate things and I could get what I wanted and I was comfortable and fed. I had all these creature comforts. But they're a waste to me. I've come to realize they matter for nothing because everything that I am and everything that I need must be grounded and rooted in Jesus Christ. For it is in Christ and the resurrection of the Lord that my life was saved, that I turned around and looked, dared to look into the face of glory and think I could possibly belong on the same road as Jesus, dirty feet and all. But there's another story. There's the gospel story that's in line for us today. Maybe you've heard it. There's a woman and there's some nard or perfume and there's some hair and some feet and an angry guy. Comes out next week on Lifetime. Otherwise known as Judas and Mary and Jesus. Sometimes we confuse this Mary with Mary Magdalene. So I'm all about freeing people. So it's not Mary Magdalene. It's not Mary Magdalene. It's Mary of Bethany. You remember Mary and Martha and Lazarus? It's Mary of Bethany. Mary of Bethany didn't have a lot. She didn't have a lot to give. Jesus had said three times to the disciples and those around him who would listen, and we remember that women were part of the movement of the ministry. In fact, they funded it. And she heard him say that he would be tried, that he would die, and that he would rise. She heard him say it three times. And he comes in and she recognizes on the Wednesday of Holy Week, she needed to prepare him for burial. A different kind of faith, the kind of faith that said, I listened to you, God, and I'm going to respond. So she took this glass, this jar of perfume, very fragrant stuff, and she poured it all out. The contents of that jar was worth one annual salary. Can you imagine pouring out the contents of one entire annual salary on a guy's feet? It's pretty extravagant, it's pretty out of the box, pretty out of the jar. <laughs> and then she went and made it even more intimate. She took her very hair, every hair on her head, not a cloth, not a hand, every hair. Not only did she give every penny of salary and every ounce of perfume, she gave every bit of her all the way down to the hairs on her head to recognize and anoint the Lord. And Judas is angry. 
How can we dare to spend that kind of money? How wasteful of us to pour it out on your feet. And he's angry and he yells at Jesus. And in the Gospel of John, John's perspective was actually not to spend time focusing on Judas, but his perspective was to spend time focusing on Mary. And Judas was screaming and upset. Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor. Okay, He wasn't actually caring that the money was not going to go to the poor. It was He kept the common purse, you see. It was an annual year's salary he couldn't pilfer from. But Jesus said, leave her alone. I like when Jesus stands up. Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus would go on to say that Mary would be remembered and the story told for all time and people would remember her for her generous extravagance. Ironic that we started to twist Mary of Bethany into Mary Magdalene and started to say this was all about a prostitute. Don't you think that's funny? Me neither. But it isn't ironic or interesting or even perplexing to me how we would take a story that's so powerful to who we are as disciples and not understand it. She didn't have much. She gave everything she had to the hairs of her head to anoint and prepare Christ. And we are to remember her for this work. Why? Because she gave everything she had to believing that this God was everything he said he was, to believing in the hope and promise of Christ, the very thing the people of exile in the Psalms believed, that there was something greater, a promise. As we come to the table of communion today, it'll be a promise, a covenant. Do you so believe in the covenant and promise that God has made with you that you take this with reverence? That you understand the covenant? You understand that God has stood up for you and said, leave him alone. Leave her alone. Well, God has, and God will continue to fight for you. But are we willing to continue to come or to even come for the first time and pour out all we have for the promise of the kingdom? A really cool thing about Mary of Bethany is scholars would say that she became that day the very first Christian. Why? Because she believed in the death and resurrection before she ever saw it. She believed Christ before any of the other disciples, before he was ever resurrected. She believed. Can we believe? In old bones getting new life, will these bones live again? Can we believe with the same kind of heart and passion as Mary of Bethany? Do we believe that God can step into the community, the center of Shawnee, Oklahoma, where you have been reported on in nasty ways across the country? Do we believe that God can come here and turn this community upside down, inside out, and turn it into a community that people all around will want to be in? Because we serve our neighbor, we love our neighbor, we see our neighbor. Because I do. I think Christ is standing outside in the streets going, I'm here. Anybody want to join me? Anybody want to come with me? We've got people to love. We've got feet to wash. We've got mouths to feed and lives to change. What can you do with what you have? What dream can you ignite with what we have? We have to take what we have and revision it, repackage it, make it, so that more and more lives are changed. Replenish, refuel, be filled again.